So, um, I have the privilege to present the European Central Bank's uh, annual report on financial integration 2018, and I will be followed by John Berrigan to present the Commission's report, a uh, review on financial stability and integration. If the slides could be pulled up on the screen, that would be good. Um, so let me start, hoping that the slides will come up very soon, um, with some uh, remarks on the aggregate picture. So my presentation is divided in two parts. A first part where I will go over our overall assessment of financial integration, and a second part where I uh, will uh, select a few of the policy issues that we have discussed in this year's uh, report. Um, so let me come first to the aggregate picture. If the slides were on the screen at this very moment, you would see two lines. One is blue, <laughs> the other is yellow. And I'm sure you see it in a second. And um, we like to look at these composite indicators of financial integration. The uh, yellow one is the price indicator. Um, and the blue one is the quantity indicator. So basically, the yellow aggregate indicator shows uh, the price differences across euro area countries um, for money markets, bond markets, equity markets, and banking markets. And the uh, quantity-based indicator shows um, uh, the blue lines uh, for uh, cross-border holdings of equity, bonds, and money market uh, transactions. And uh, what you see, in this very moment uh, is that uh, we had actually a uh, significant recovery in the price-based indicator. As you see on the very right-hand side, the uh, sharp increase in the yellow line, which is the composite indicator on prices, whereas we had not such a development yet, question mark, in the quantity-based indicator because quantities tend to move slower as a rule than uh, prices. Uh, this is a continuation by now of a reintegration trend, or as I may say, a post-crisis reintegration trend that started in the middle of 2012, which remember is a, was a path-breaking council meeting um, uh, where the banking union was agreed and then uh, very significant decisions were taken uh, following after that. Uh, and then this uh, post-crisis reintegration trend took off and actually last year, in last year's report, we reported these kinks that you see, these stops of this reintegration trend, which, um, which is around 2016, which, as you may remember, was these times of political uncertainty in Europe where this reintegration trend stopped, but now it has resumed in particular in prices. Where does this come from? It's primarily driven by uh, equity return convergence and to a somewhat lesser um, extent in uh, bond yield uh, convergence, and overall driven primarily by the strengthening, broadening, and rather uniform economic recovery in, in the euro area, uniform across countries, which obviously drives, for example, uh, the equity prices. So overall, um, a lot of fundamental factors are behind this resumption of the um, uh, euro area reintegration trend. Now, as I already remarked, we didn't see uh, precisely the same picture uh, on the quantity side, which is the blue line, so the cross-border holdings of assets, the quantity of assets, so which moves uh, sidewise, and that basically reflects that in equity and bond holdings, not so much uh, changed uh, in terms of the investors' cross-border holdings, and there was a slight reduction in interbank lending over that reporting period um, that we show here. After having uh, given you this overall picture on the financial integration development both over the last year and, the, and somewhat the medium term, let me uh, highlight a few other interesting developments on uh, the overall financial integration picture. One observation that we make in a special feature um, of this year's report, which is special feature B on, on the integration of corporate bond markets, is that actually, among other things, investment funds can play a helpful role in quantity-based integration, for example. Um, on this chart, you see a comparison of the current cross-country capitalization of corporate bond markets, which is the very left-hand side pillar. The different colors reflect the share of countries in the capitalization of corporate bond markets. And a comparison to the right uh, for different financial intermediaries of the direct holdings of corporate bonds, of investment funds, in particular USITs here in this case. Um, um, and uh, you see that basically, look at the third and the fifth column 
um, which is the one for uh, ICPF, which is referring to insurance corporations and pension funds. And the left, the third pillar, shows basically the direct holdings of corporate bonds across countries. And the fifth pillar shows the indirect holdings of corporate bonds um, across countries, including also uh, the direct ones and including the indirect ones via investment funds, via USITs. So you see that the colors become somehow, when you move right, somehow more uniform, which reflects that actually uh, investment usage help other investors like insurance corporations, pension funds, but also banks to a slightly lesser extent to diversify better across countries. So in this regard, they are helpful for quantity-based uh, financial integration. Obviously, we also need to, this is a structural change given the uh, popularity of investment funds lately. There was strong growth in Europe and also in other parts of the world. We, uh, this structural change in the financial system needs obviously also to be monitored from a, uh, from a financial stability angle as this can obviously change also uh, to new sources of financial risks or different channels of transmission if financial shocks would emerge, which we actually do in our financial stability work um, in the ECB. Third observation on the overall assessment of financial integration is related to how resilient is the integration that we have achieved after quite some time of a post-crisis reintegration trend. Now, we do look at a number of indicators, primarily in four dimensions, um, comparing cross-border holdings of assets along a number of dimensions. On the left-hand side, you see a chart of the relative proportion of cross-border equity investment relative to cross-border debt investment. Equity investment tends to be more resilient to financial shocks than debt investment, which is more subject to potential sudden stops if there are negative sh uh, shocks. The blue line is actually the, sh the, the share of cross-border debt securities holdings as, as a share of total debt securities holding, cross-border to total. And the yellow line is actually the cross-border equity holdings. As you see, the debt part is going down, the equity part is going up, and actually the red line is the ratio of the two, which means in cross-border investment, there is a trend since some time, with some fluctuations, that equity becomes more important than debt. And this uh, is likely to be a, a resiliency enhancing. Now this chart is representative also for a number of other indicators of resilience. One is the share of foreign direct investment as compared to portfolio equity investment, so within the equity class. Actually, you have a similar trend that the FDI across euro area countries within the euro area becomes larger relative to portfolio equity investments. And since the FDI is more stable than the portfolio equity investments, that's resiliency enhancing. You don't see that on the charts. And the third dimension is the degree of retail cross-border bank lending as compared to interbank lending. Interbank lending, again, is more subject to potential sudden, stock, uh, shocks, uh, sh uh, sudden stops in times of bad shocks. Um, and the retail tends to be more stable. And as the interbank is uh, somewhat down relative to retail, also that uh, trends up. And we're also more resilient on the banking side. So a lot of good news on the resilience. There's one exception, which you see on the right-hand side, which I show there, which is the relative proportion of long-term debt in cross-border holdings as compared to short-term debt. So you have the long-term debt is the blue line, the short-term debt is the yellow line, and the ratio again is the red line. And you see from the chart that actually after there was a trend of more resilience after the crisis, somewhere in 2014-15 it has reversed. So the, the, the long-term debt holdings are more stable now and the short-term have increased. So there's a slight increase in the short-term debt cross-border holdings relative to the long-term debt which um, we should be monitor because that means that part of this enhanced in resilience that we saw after the crisis has been a little bit reversed since then. So this makes me uh, move on to the selected policy issues that we have chosen from our report uh, to present to you now. Um, the first point is based on a special feature that we have in the report, a special feature A. Um, which actually makes the point that Europe has an interest to better, even further develop equity markets relative to other capital markets and financial markets. And actually, I heard from uh, Vice President Dombrovskis a number of elements that are actually already in the CMU, like a venture capital initiative and transparency initiatives on small, medium-sized firms, uh, which is exactly what we mean here. Um, uh, but 
there's probably also a long-term need to go beyond that and go further based on a new literature that says now, compared to previously, that financial structure may matter more than we thought. Financial structure means here is defined for the purpose of this feature and in that literature roughly as the degree of equity financing relative to bank lending. So capital market equity financing relative to bank lending. So that literature suggests that um, uh, countries that have a larger share of equity market financing to uh, bank lending or to debt uh, financing actually do tend to grow faster, have a faster promotion of growth from the financial markets. And we have in that special feature, our colleagues have actually uh, done, uh, corrobor corroborated these um, findings for the European Union. So basically based off 21 European Union countries, regressions were run uh, where, whether these um, results hold also for Europe. And the results were basically of this new literature was basically confirmed. So it, was sh it shows here that the countries with the larger equity markets, uh, the sectors uh, of, that have good growth uh, prospects actually experienced a larger firm value added growth than countries that had smaller equity markets. And particularly, this is also observed for sectors, the high value added growth for larger equity markets, for particularly um, high tech uh, sectors and patent intensive sectors. So which uh, relates to the fact that the equity markets are better than the bank lending markets in financing uh, innovative industries, innovative growth industries. And most interestingly, perhaps, perhaps uh, the authors find that actually this uh, growth effect is driven less by capital deepening uh, and more by labor productivity increases that come from this equity market financing, which again supports the view that if Europe wanted to uh, enhance the financing options for growth industry, innovative growth industries, then uh, a further development over time of the equity markets is particularly valuable. This is not the only reason for developing equity markets. There's also more mature literature that suggests that cross-border uh, equity holdings in firms, cl firm claims, actually enhance cross-border risk sharing um, in federations, in, in, in uh, areas, in economic areas like, um, like the euro area, which is based on federal countries. So this increase of uh, equity market development uh, together with more cross-border holdings of this equity would actually also help countries to ensure ag against uh, the risk of income fluctuations translating into a lot of consumption fluctuations for the household sector. Now, very briefly, uh, what are directions how you could get to this um, uh, more important capital market-based equity market financing? We discussed this in a box in the chapter one of the report. There are a number of directions. Mr. Dombrovskis mentioned some that are already in the capital markets union agenda. We also tend to think that um, in addition to the current agenda, there's probably also medium-term interest to go beyond 2019 and have a, a sustained effort in those directions. And some of these directions include the following. First, enhancing financial literacy across countries, which could lead ceteris paribus to larger equity holdings. Uh, and second, uh, the development of pension systems. Uh, Mr. Dombrovskis has mentioned the PEP, which is a product where the investments could go, but there's also another side of the coin is that is the savings, is the private savings. So as demography evolves, probably the part of the savings has to increase, the private savings relative to pay as you go, and therefore more money would flow actually and could actually be used with such products like the PEP. And that would also be part of the picture. And then a very important topic that was also already mentioned before as well is the insolvency frameworks. So we have tried um, in this research that we report in the report this year to go um, even beyond the very valuable initiative that is in the capital markets union agenda, which is the directive on the draft directive on insolvency restructuring and second chance, which proposes a number of very important directions to better harmonize and improve uh, insolvency frameworks, corporate insolvency frameworks um, in the European Union. So we were asking ourselves, so what? What, how, what can one do to go beyond that? There's quite a number of things one could do, and we just focus on two here, which is the reorganization proceedings and creditor participation. So why these two? Well, first of all, our research suggests that improved insolvency frameworks, 
in measured in various ways, um, actually do foster risk sharing across countries, again, both through the capital markets and through the bank credit markets. And that, um, uh, so these uh, risk sharing, the question is then in Europe, in the euro area, for example, which are the aspects of insolvency frameworks that are either very diverse still, or where the average um, quality measured by what practitioners tend to regard as best practices is lower than, say, a very high, high efficiency of an insolvency framework. And you see in the chart on the left a characterization of a part of an indicator from the World Bank that is called resolving insolvency, uh, where you see among some of the uh, insolvency framework uh, aspects the, the dispersion of uh, the differences across euro area countries, which is uh, the, the, the lines, the, the green lines, for example, which show the maximum, the minimum, or the blue uh, uh, rectangles, they show the, the difference between the first and the third quartile of the performance across different euro area countries. And you see that in terms of reorganization proceedings and credit participation, in the euro area, the dispersion is quite high still across countries. It, it ranges between, for the reorganization proceedings, it even ranges between the minimum and the maximum of the indicator, which is zero and six here. And for the creditor participation, is somehow similar. And the median level of these aspects of insolvency frameworks, which is shown by the yellow bar in the middle of the blue rectangles, actually is quite a bit below the maximum value of this indicator, which is six. So we would argue that these are going further for a medium-term perspective of a sustained capital markets effort in Europe would be valuable directions uh, to go forward to further work on the dossier on uh, insolvency frameworks. Now, we should, of course, be careful and also remember that um, insolvency frameworks also depend on the court system. And there is also this dispersion in the judicial efficiency across European countries. So the, insolvent, the legal insolvency frameworks can only work as well as the legal system does that supports it. And it's a complicated matter. A lot of competence is required in a judicial system to efficiently handle fra insolvency frameworks. And there's also a dispersion in Europe. So um, probably there's a number of countries where probably the judicial efficiency would need to be enhanced, where it's still relatively slow and um, formalistic. And as we know from other empirical work, the slower the system operates, the lower tend to become the recovery rates in um, the recovery rates in insolvency proceedings, which then uh, is bad for the investors. So uh, the investors are more enthusiastic to invest in areas where actually, in case of default, the recovery rates are better. So the court system is very important. Now, this is something very difficult to change. Obviously, it's a very deep-rooted historical aspect of an, of, of, of an economic system is the court system. So. What would be alternatives to make faster progress? Well, many countries have made good experiences with out-of-court frameworks. Um, and again, the picture is quite diverse. There are countries in Europe that have them, relatively well developed. There are others that not. So the question is, what could we do there to make um, a bit of progress? So one option would be a non-binding EU guideline that uh, the countries could benchmark on and that could be used. A more substantive step would be to introduce a formal EU regime for out-of-court settlements, which could be contemplated. Then there are other issues of insolvency frameworks. I've only talked about the capital markets and the corporates here. There's, of course, also the financial system. The ECB and other players have views about, in the banking regulatory framework, how there the solvency side could be improved. Two aspects are mentioned here, the general depositor preference and a better harmonization of supplementary capital instruments, which are more on the banking union side, which I just mentioned in passing. Um, then the question is, in, in the small list of my policy issues that I've picked from our report, is that there are a few things where we can contribute as ECB, or for example, in this case here, what you see on the slide now, ECB banking supervision, um, uh, with respect to um, improving the background for, uh, capital, mar for capital markets and uh, banking markets. And in the banking market side here, uh, we have picked the options and national discretions of the banking regulatory framework. So we have a single rule book in Europe, but the, it has a peculiarity in Europe that there are a lot of options and national discretions um, uh, for specific countries that can apply for their country certain aspects differently. Aspects that are affected by that in this uh, feature of our banking regulatory framework are capital regulation, liquidity regulation, large exposure regulation, and also gov uh, certain governance issues. And, but then there are the possibility for the competent supervisors 
to actually make waivers. Just to take an example, if there is in the liquidity coverage ratio the necessity that subsidiaries in different euro area countries have to uh, fulfill it in each single country, rather than in the consolidated way for, uh, for a, a cross-border group, then um, the, uh, uh, there is a possibility to enact a waiver to say that actually the prudential requirements are well enough fulfilled such that actually the LCR has only to be fulfilled for the whole concern across all European countries, which of course makes it easier for liquidity flows within the concern to move. And this is just by means of mentioning one example that you understand what I'm, what I'm talking about. Something similar is on the, um, on the capital side. Now here, um, the ECB um, monitors and actually suggests to remove impediments to waivers, to these waivers um, for cases where they are not justified by uh, prudential considerations. And in the, in the table here, I have made a short overview taken from the uh, box in our chapter two on the options and national discretions where I quickly summarize the current policy. So on the liquidity side, there is an existing policy. It's in the current framework to use of waivers. It's actually in, in the uh, Article 8 of the Capital Requirements Regulation and an ECB guide on option and national discretions. And it says that the uh, liquidity waiver can be granted to uh, subject to certain prudential conditions that are listed down there. So there are certain thresholds below which you can, cannot go. And actually, there's even a review clause that some, sometime soon uh, there will be reviewed even to lower these type of lower bounds of reducing um, the uh, thresholds for, for the liquidity waiver. Um, so um, that is an existing policy. Then there's a proposal from the ECB side on the capital side, an opinion on the review of the capital requirements regulation, subject to certain um, a supervisory prudential precautions that again, um, a waiver uh, could, be made, um, could be made easier and uh, it follows a similar approach. Certain prudential precautions have to be fulfilled to, uh, to receive this uh, waiver and then there should be a review after some time to see whether the prudence was, uh, was uh, fulfilled and then one could think about potentially relaxing that over time. This is a, at the level of a proposal. It's not yet um, the current, in the current uh, framework. But we have the view that in line with the banking union over time, um, this, there, there could be progress, for example, along the lines of the, of the capital waivers, for example. And that concludes my presentation with a uh, remark on, uh, I said, what we can do ourselves. And here I took the example of the um, uh, payments and settlement infrastructure. So as many of you know, uh, 2007 was a very important year from that side, from uh, uh, activities supporting the European capital markets that we also contribute ourselves, the euro system, the national central banks and the ECB. A major milestone was reached by the introduction, the full migration of target two securities, um, uh, which was fulfilled, uh, I believe, in September uh, uh, last year. A major milestone in the integration of securities markets, in particular their post-trade landscape, which are now having 20 European markets and 20 central securities depositories operating on a single platform, the T2S platform. Thank you very much. Okay, well, good morning everybody. I would uh, like to start by thanking the ECB and particularly Victor Constanzio for hosting the conference this year. Uh, I'm also very pleased to follow Philip's excellent presentation by presenting the, the main elements of our own report for 2018. For those of you referring to an older program, you're probably expecting to see Olivier Gerson here. Um, due to a last minute change, Olivier could not make it, so he's asked me to step in. I'm happy to do so. You can be assured the speaking notes are exactly the same, even if the accent is a little bit less exotic, let's say. Um, let me start by presenting our report. I mean, the, I will move this forward. The first, the first chapters of our report tend to focus on an overall assessment of macrofinancial conditions in the EU and in the euro area economy. I think here the general message that comes out is that the economic and financial environment has continued to improve in 2017 and into early 2018. I think economic activity has strengthened. We see, which is important from our perspective of CMU, that market-based funding is becoming a little bit more pronounced and the resilience of EU banks has been further reinforced. 
So our overall assessment of macrofinancial conditions is positive, and this, I think, reflects a range of policy measures that we have taken both here in the ECB but also elsewhere throughout the post-crisis period. So in a sense, uh, it's been a rough road, but we're, we are beginning to emerge, I think, from this post-crisis period. It does not mean, however, that we're out of the woods. I think the experience of the crisis teaches us that we should remain vigilant at all times. Uh, we should not take our eye off the ball. And even if the economic and financial trends are generally moving in the right direction, I think the crisis has left many legacy problems. And while exiting some of the crisis response measures that we've taken will themselves present important policy challenges. So we are doing well, but vulnerabilities and risks still remain. The report also contains two special features, fo uh, special focus chapters, and these take a look at two aspects which I think will be important to future policy making in the EU. The first, as the Vice President mentioned, examines the development of local capital markets, particularly in Central and Southern Eastern Europe. We there, what we want to do there is to broaden our understanding of how these kind of local capital markets and how they can develop in a way that is consistent with the future, their future integration into a broader uh, single capital market. And I'll come back to that later. The second special chapter focuses on the fintech sector and more specifically on uh, so-called crypto tokens. You know, crypto tokens have received a lot of attention lately, not least because of the Bitcoin bubble, but the extent to which these kind of phenomena, like initial coin offerings, can be viable sources of alternative startup financing has received less attention. And so we want to look a little bit more at the, the opportunities of these phenomena rather than uh, focusing uniquely on, on their risks. Let me just start by uh, looking at the overall economic situation. At the beginning of 2018 and back into 2017, our reporting period, I mean, as you see, their economic activity in the EU has strengthened gradually throughout the period. So quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth rates in the EU and the euro area are now well above 2.5%, although the last quarter did show some sign of softening. But what's important for us, underlying all these figures, is that all member states now, all member states, are enjoying positive economic growth. Core inflation has remained subdued, and this is despite narrowing output gaps and the improving labour market conditions. Interest rates have also remained low, supported by the monetary policy stance and the ECB's asset purchase programme. And I'll come back to some of these issues later when we talk about some risks on the horizon. I think because of low inflation and low interest rates, you know, investors have been expanding their activity, particularly in bond markets, where they have showed a renewed and increased appetite for yield, moving into the less credit-worthy sectors of the market. Interestingly, this volume is going up, but I noticed from Philip's presentation that it's not necessarily moving across border. But in overall terms, we are seeing that the, the use of, cross of bond markets is increasing. As the use of bond markets has increased, the spreads on corporate bonds have narrowed across the spectrum. I think we've put up here sovereign bonds mainly because of the experience we had in the euro area debt crisis. So it's important to note that in this period of recovering growth, sovereign debt yields and the spreads on sovereign debt yields have also narrowed. This is partly due to a, a small rise in benchmark yields as the economy recovers, but more importantly towards a decline in the, in the peripheral, further decline in the peripheral yields. So in general, the picture is looking a little bit better on the sovereign debt side as well. What's not shown here, but also I should say EU stock markets have moved higher in 2017. This is again reflecting the improved economic conditions. Now, this trend was interrupted by a rather abrupt correction in February uh, in global stock markets, we think mainly linked to concerns about global trade. That has now largely reversed itself, but the fact that it happened you know, reminds us of the sensitivity of markets now, particularly equity markets, but markets in general, to you know, outstanding news and oncoming news. And so while low interest rates have kind of eased funding conditions and supported growth, they've also been associated with you know, a sharp increase in the valuation of bonds and the valuation of assets and also the valuation of real estate. So some of this will sound uncomfortably familiar to those of us who were around before uh, 2007 
So, you know, these valuations are there, but we must be aware that they could be brought into question by any sudden or sharp change in risk premia. So what we see now is that overall market particip participants seem to have shown confidence in the prospect of a sort of orderly unwinding of the unconventional monetary policy measures taken in response to the crisis, an orderly winding perhaps over a, an extended period of time. And I think such a smooth and gradual unwinding would gradually raise risk-free interest rates and help take hopefully some of the froth out of these other market segments. But this is the central scenario. And more abrupt adjustment scenarios, of course, cannot be ruled out. And indeed, the risk of a more generalized and sustained correction in asset prices is one of the main macroprudential risks identified by the ESRB. And by the way, that risk has been on the table now for, for quite some time. Now, amid this global economic recovery, what we have seen is international capital flows have stabilized, albeit at lower levels than before the crisis. It's difficult to say if we have now come back to what is a new normal. I'm not sure what new normal is anymore. The crisis has changed most of our metrics. But I think it is very unlikely that international capital flows will return to the pre-crisis levels. This is for two reasons. I think, first, the crisis itself showed that these levels were unsustainable before the crisis, and they were, of course, corrected. And second, the global imbalances that underlay those international financial flows uh, are not there, and our intention is to ensure that they do not re-emerge. So it is difficult to say where we are in terms of the trend in the international flow of capital, and I think there's still scope for further like, financial globalization, but this time we better ensure that it's on a sound and a sustainable basis. Now, within this context of stabilizing international capital flows, it's notable that both the EU and the euro area have remained net exporters of capital. Indeed, the euro area is now the largest exporter of capital globally. Investment in both the EU and the euro area has increased, but this export of capital, of course, reflects the fact that the recovery in investment levels, at least as far as we can see, is not yet complete. And based on projections for the savings investment gap, the EU is expected to continue to export capital in net terms throughout the next three years. Now, foreign direct investment has become relatively more important, which is quite good news, because this trend towards FTI is a little bit more conducive to safeguarding financial stability, because I think, as has been mentioned by Philip as well, some, some investments are less sensible or less susceptible to stops and, and sharp reversals, and FDI is one of those. So we're quite happy to see that trend. Given our uh, focus on capital markets union and our central aims of capital markets union is to incentivize businesses to diversify their funding sources, so we're also keeping a close eye on the you know, reliance of firms on market funding, which we hope to see go up over time. I think the crisis revealed the vulnerability implied by an excessive reliance on bank-based funding. So this more diversified financial system, we think, is not only good for economic growth, but also good for economic uh, resilience. And in 2017, non-financial corporations further increased their reliance on market-based funding. For example, corporate bond issuance expanded rapidly at an annual growth rate of 9%. Now, what we see when we look back over the last few years is that bond financing, we think, is becoming a more structural component of non-financial corporations financing mix. What that means is that more recently, bank and bond financing have acted more as complements to each other, whereas earlier in the post-crisis phase, it was clear that market-based funding was substituting for a decline in bank lending. Equity financing has also increased, but again, at a slower pace than bonds. Um, current IPO activity is still well below pre-crisis levels, and we think it looks below what one might expect to see in the current economic upswing. So this is a concern for us in terms of CMU, and you know, increased investment in equity is a key objective of what we're doing in Capital Markets Union, and these figures would suggest to us that we are not yet where we want to be in CMU. And so it's essential that any unjustified barriers, regulatory or otherwise, faced by firms wishing to fund via public equity markets are alleviated or removed. And that's a large part of what CMU action plan is about. 
quick word on banks, um, because developing a sound banking sector, of course, is another key priority for the EU policymakers. We think, on average, EU European banks further improved their solvency in 2017 and managed to slightly improve their profitability. When you look at averages around European banks, of course, you must always be aware of the distributions, which are often uh, rather wide. But on average, we think the European banking system is improving in terms of its solvency. Bank capital positions have strengthened, driven mostly by a decline in risk-weighted assets. Credit risk has declined overall, and despite these significant differences across banks and member states, I think the picture in general is good. Asset quality improved slightly as banks in most member states took measures to reduce their remaining stock of non-performing loans. And on the liability side, European banks increased their reliance on deposits, and that so secures more stable funding. Interestingly, the reform of balance sheets has tended to sort of realign bank business models towards their more traditional activities. So we see more lending and deposit taking as a percentage of the total balance sheet. So they have reduced their market-based exposures in the form of securities and derivatives and increased the weight of loans and deposits. Banks have also improved their earnings performance by reducing many operational costs. They've availed of lower funding costs and they've had some increase in net income related to fees and commissions. So all of this reflecting somewhat more buoyancy in financial markets and the economy more generally. I would say, however, that the profitability remains a challenge for EU banks given the prevailing low interest rates and the, uh, the tight net interest margins that most of them are facing. And of course, in some cases, uh, high provisions covering non-performing loans. Uh, high NPL ratios in some member states, I think, are one of the main legacies of the crisis. Uh, progress has been made in reducing these ratios, with the EU average, I think the Vice President mentioned, now falling towards 4%. <laughs> but again, this average is well above the historical norm, and of course, it hides pretty wide dispersions, you know, dramatically wide dispersions in some cases, across member states. So that's just a quick summary of where we are on the sort of overall assessment in the early chapters of the report. I'll just say a few quick words about the two special focus chapters. Um, as noted in the ECB's report, uh, the further development of capital markets and equity markets in particular, and this is a point that was made particularly by Philip, and this is very important in terms of cross-country risk sharing, but it's also important to foster innovation and, and growth. And while there has been considerable economic convergence in the EU since 1999, I think many of the member states are still at very different stages of financial development. In particular, the capital markets of member states in Central and Eastern Europe are structurally less developed than the markets of other member states, both in terms of market depth and access. I mean, to put this bluntly, if you take the Capital Market <coughs> Union Action Plan to Zagreb, they sometimes ask you exactly what is in this for me. And what is in this, of course, is a part which talks about developing financial markets and not just integrating existing financial markets. Now, Vice President Dombrovskis has mentioned that these member states account for one-fifth of the population, 8% of its economy, but they're very much underrepresented in terms of total EU-listed shares and outstanding bonds. I think you'll see in these two charts, I'm not going to go into detail, but you'll see that you know, these countries are all located in the, towards the origin of these charts, which is the weaker part of the spectrum. So it indicates that the potential for development in these member states is there, both in terms of listed shares and debt instruments, and indeed in terms of financial market access more generally. So you know, we are putting a lot of attention now on local market capital development, uh, in, in, as a means to help these member states to catch up in their financial development and then therefore also to plug themselves in to a more efficient single capital market that we hope to build with the CMU action plan. You know, to that end, you know, we, we look for things more towards the lower end of what we call the funding escalator. So we're looking more for venture capital, private equity, business angels, these kinds of developments in these countries so that they can reach a level of development where they can then, of course, move into more uh, mature markets around public equity and, and bond markets. 
we are providing technical assistance to many of these member states. And what's important in providing this technical assistance is to understand that we have to use that to improve the operating conditions for institutional investors, but in particular for private equity and venture capital funds. So we need to optimise these conditions. That means not only a sound regulatory and supervisory framework, which we can give them from the EU level, but also means that they must have strong institutions nationally. As Philip was mentioning in his presentation, they need reliable legal systems, they need efficient judiciaries. So all of these things we will have to work at. Um, th this, in a way, is easier said than done. Um, strong institutions are built over time. Reliable legal system, many member states see their system is already reliable. This is a matter of perception. An efficient and effective judiciary, well, that's an area where we don't want to get into. But of course, these out of court settlements that Philip mentioned are one way in which we can make judicial systems more effective. But of course, they do require specialised courts. And from my experience in uh, one particular member state during the crisis, the judiciary is not always keen on having specialised courts. They seem to believe they are wise in general and therefore they are wise in the specifics as well. So, you know, with all this in mind, it's a difficult job, but we are, you know, working with this. We want to develop local capital markets and we see this as going hand in hand with the objective of achieving market integration at EU level. There is, however, always an inevitable tension here, I should admit it. What we don't want to do is to create another 10 or 12 local capital markets that have all developed on their own way and are almost impossible then to integrate when we come to the integration phase. So this is a process where we will try from the centre to give some guidance in terms of how they develop so that when they reach a mature stage, they will be better and more easily able to click in to the more developed market in the other member states. A word then about our second special focus chapter, which is on crypto tokens. You know, I think it's uh, clear that the future of the EU financial system requires a successful integration of these kind of value-creating fintech solutions. That certainly is what we believe and what we stated clearly in the action plan we produced recently. At the same time, we must be vigilant against the risks that some of these new technologies will bring along. But I think the balance for us must be in terms of looking at these things as opportunities and not always looking at them in terms of risks. So in this second special focus chapter, we zoom in on one specific aspect of fintech, which is the development of crypto tokens. And we attempt in this chapter to shed some light on the phenomenon of so-called initial coin offerings, these ICOs. Now, these ICOs have recently become topical due to the substantial funds being raised by blockchain startups. The second half of 2017 was characterized by a spectacular rise in the price of Bitcoin and the emergence of hundreds of crypto tokens. The aggregate market capitalization of all types of crypto tokens went up from about 17 billion euros at the start of 2017 to almost 700 billion euros a year later. This represented a 45-fold increase. So it's starting from a slow base, small base, but it's moving fast. And in part, this was driven by the growing popularity of ICOs, which of course require the use of crypto tokens. Now in 2017, EU startups raised some Euro 750 million through ICOs, representing over a fifth of all funds raised through ICOs globally. And in this context, we think the term initial coin offering is of course meant to resemble the term initial public offering. But they are of course rather different processes. You know, if you draw parallels between ICOs and IPOs, I think this is misleading. Most ICOs have so far come at a very much earlier stage in a firm's life cycle than an IPO would. So I think the more appropriate comparators, and we believe this in the, in the report, the more appropriate comparators or benchmarks for ICOs would be various types of risk capital, including equity crowdfunding and venture capital. These sources of financing are all relevant during the inception, seed, and early growth stages of company development. So in a sense, you can see a link here in this chapter and the earlier chapter, see to what extent some of these newer financing models might even be usable in some of the less developed markets. 
Now, we believe that the term token sale would reflect the substance of the phenomenon of ICOs far better than IPOs. So let's use token sale. It can be described as an entrepreneur selling tokens to fund a startup, usually in exchange for established cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin or Ether. Now, clearly, ICOs or token sales offer amazing new financing opportunities for small businesses, and we see them as opportunities. But of course, investors, and particularly retail investors, can take significant risks when investing in these operations. So while we see it as an opportunity, we are not, of course, uh, naive about the risks. And so in, cooperating, in cooperation with market supervisors, the Commission is exploring ways to ensure that the regulatory objectives of applicable consumer protection and financial services legislation are fully respected. And to this end, in general, we believe that the ICO market probably needs to become more transparent. Also, given the global nature of ICOs, I mean, regulatory cooperation at global level will also be essential for developing a market for ICOs that achieves global scope and avoids the risk of regulatory arbitrage. Interesting enough, though, I was in the United States uh, the week before last, and they're very much at the same level of discussion as we are here in Europe. This is something which looks very interesting, great opportunities, but potentially uh, risky. And so we're all trying to work out what is the best way uh, to approach it. So let me conclude by just summarizing that, in our view, macro financial developments in 2017 and early 2018 confirm that we are progressively emerging from the aftermath of the financial crisis. Not bad after 10 years, I suppose. Uh, the EU economy, economy is witnessing one of its longest and most broadly based periods of recovery. Financial conditions remain favourable, reflecting a generally supportive policy stance. But, and this of course we always say, and I come from the financial stability side, we must remain vigilant. I mean, there are many legacy risks out there, and they remain potentially threatening. Bank balance sheets remain under pressure in many member states, either due to still high NPL ratios, still low profitability, or indeed a combination of both. New risks linked to possible overvaluation of assets or high levels of debt, debt levels being even higher than they were before the crisis, are emerging in, in the context of this you know, possible future withdrawal of accommodative monetary policy. But uh, to end on a more upbeat note, I think when looking forward, we should not only focus on risks, we've been focused on risks for a long time, we must also grasp opportunities, I think, and the opportunity to develop and integrate capital markets in the Capital Markets Union is one, and there's an opportunity to incorporate new technologies in our financial system is another. And I'm hoping that when we're at next year's conference in Brussels, we will be talking about a further reinforcement of the EU's post-crisis recovery and further progress in grasping the important opportunities of financial integration and innovation. Thank you very much. Okay, we have uh, some time for questions, obviously. So the floor is open. Uh, there's a gentleman in the middle and um, Please uh, don't forget to state your name and affiliation. So. Thank, thank you very much uh, for the presentations. Uh, Antonio Garcia del Riego, Banco Santander. I would like to refer to um, comments made um, on the need to enhance uh, um, uh, equity capital markets uh, all over Europe. And the link with um, um, providing finance to innovative uh, uh, firms in Europe. I think that we have a very um, recent and important example of the need to, to foster this when we have seen Spotify going to the States to raise capital. Uh, my question uh, goes in the direction of what can we do to move fast and uh, quick uh, on this endeavor uh, because this is becoming uh, crucial for, for Europe. Um, um, I think I agree with one of the comments made about the need to enhance um, equity literacy in Europe, but I think that we have to foster more things. Uh, today we see um, uh, tax bias in favour of debt versus equity, for instance, and it is something that I think that we have to, 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 to consider. Um, so, again, my question is how can we move fast in this direction? Thank you. Thank you. Shall we collect a bit or you shall take one more? No. Correct. 
Let, let's collect three questions and then we will try to, uh, if there are further questions on equity, for example, so there's another lady on the, in the middle. Thank you. I'm Nathalie Gay Guggenheim from HSBC. Um, and it's also a question relating to the equity markets in Europe. Um, we've just implemented, and we are still implementing MIFID II, uh, which obviously had a clear objective on improving price formation and the functioning of markets in Europe. Um, it would be good to have, of course, an impact assessment of MIFID II and how it impacted research, indeed price formation, market liquidity, etc. And as you mentioned also previously, impact of the Brexit on the uh, functioning of capital markets in Europe. Um, so it's really a question for you too. Is an impact assessment um, in, the, in the process of being made by the Commission or the, the ECB? And also, um, we've implemented a lot of very useful regulations such as uh, MAD, MAR, and, um, and other market regulations that are really improved the, the way um, market participants operate, including with all the EBA um, uh, and the, the ECB um, guidelines uh, in terms of uh, operations, internal control, etc. So, this comes at a cost, which means that if we want to develop local markets, in, notably in Central and Eastern Europe, um, and we, of course we don't want to, um, to uh, reduce uh, these, uh, or to um, uh, reconsider these requirements um, because they come at a cost, how can we, um, what kind of solution could we uh, imagine together to make sure that these regulations are complied with, um, but at the same time, they do not hinder the um, constitution of a new market participants. Let's take one more question um, in this round. Michael was there. there so. Uh, so, Michael Halias, again from uh, Goethe University, Frankfurt. Um, you talked about capital market uh, development, in especially in these uh, countries that you identified. One thing we know uh, from research, uh, certainly on the household side, is that a very important determinant of stock market participation of uh, households is their previous experiences, their historical experiences with their own markets. And in many of these countries that you identified, there have been you know, disasters, uh, sort of crashes, and also um, a sort of political twist, uh, you know, the cultivation of the idea that somehow stock markets get manipulated um, by big players, uh, maybe even by politicians or maybe by others, and uh, they are not to be trusted. So the, I think uh, to get this out or to, to try to escape from this predicament, um, mutual funds that tend to invest across different countries, you know, with different experiences and different reputations, if you like, different stock markets with different reputations, uh, might help both the residents of those um, countries with bad experiences, but also, uh, you know, the residents of other countries to diversify uh, and to pump more capital into those as well. So. Is the but again these impose requirements, informational requirements, uh, not only fina general financial literacy, but also um, requirements on financial advice, on uh, transparency, on advertising, cross borders, and on increased familiarity with uh, different stock markets and different companies across borders. So, is are the Commission and the ECB thinking in those directions as well, and what could promote uh, that? I can make a little start. Okay. Okay. So let me make a, a, a small start, and then John will follow up. Um, so uh, on the first question, um, how can we make uh, 
fast progress on the equity side. Uh, I'm afraid that I don't have a panacea to make this fast. This will not be fast. I mean, let, let me put it this way. It's, just, it's important that we make sustained progress step by step by first implementing the current CMU agenda and the list of items that go, um, Vice President Dombrovskis has uh, mentioned that are not all adopted uh, by now and uh, they should be adopted soon in order to meet the deadline of 2019, for example. Um, the one thing, so and I, I'm afraid that most things that, um, that, that I can come up with are, will not be fast. They will not be, if they, they will not be for this year, in three years, probably even not substantive impact. The impact will unfold over time. Uh, but you have to start. And uh, so indeed, if you take the two examples that, uh, that I mentioned in my presentation, uh, or the three, which was financial literacy, pensions, and uh, insolvency frameworks, these are all for the long haul. There's no doubt about that. Um, so you know, you, you assume you introduce a larger education in secondary school on, you know, you have to save more for your pension. Um, about what is diversification, what is accumulated interest. These are the basics uh, uh, to do this. Then this generation has to grow up and has to start saving, so we're talking about decades. The same for accumulation of assets and pension systems. Again, even if more decisive reforms would be uh, in the countries that have a lower private savings, uh, there are some countries in Europe that actually have substantial um, uh, private savings in their pension systems. In, in the Euro area, uh, Netherlands, uh, Finland, they have made large steps in that direction. But the accumulation of assets and the cross-border holdings that gives all the benefits that will, be, again, is, a, is an issue of, de of, of decades. So one should not uh, pretend that, and in particular, if you think about like, what is the comparator? No? Um, of course, many people say the US is the comparator in terms of equity market culture, but we should not forget the US is also an in, in, in extreme. It's actually an outlier in the world. There is no other country with uh, such large uh, substantive equity markets, both in the risk capital side um, and in the, in the public market side. So it's actually not necessarily the most relevant benchmark. But if you think like, say, closing, say, let's say a quarter to the substantiveness of the equity markets in the euro area compared to the US, say, let's say a quarter, which, uh, no, which is uh, sub material, but uh, this is something that uh, these single measures, if you would enact them, uh, that will take again, that will take decades, it will not be fixed uh, fast. Uh, the one thing you mention uh, on the tax side, uh, there is actually um, a, uh, something in the uh, proposal by the Commission on the Common Consolidated Tax Base, and we in the ECB tend to be supportive of diminishing the uh, tax bias favoring debt uh, relative to equity, for example, in the direction of uh, uh, making the equity more attractive uh, through a similar or a, a treatment that goes in a similar direction as, of, as for debt. That would be a direction that actually uh, would not have so um, that, you know, that, that direction is something that, um, uh, you know, can be, um, I think, can be envisioned and is actually mentioned in those proposals. It's actually so. Um, and, and that is the one you mentioned. I think we tend to be favorable towards that, to, to go in this direction, not only for the perspective of the equity market development, that's one aspect of it, but also from the financial stability dimension. And, uh, you know, I talked about debt versus equity in terms of financial shocks. Um, and uh, that would be, um, if you look at the literature, actually, uh, the more uh, decisive evidence that we have is actually showing that the financial stability implications are particularly valuable in this regard. Um, so that would be, uh, unfortunately, no panacea on the speed of this, uh, given the differences to countries that have these more uh, and, and, and the means that we have in our hands. I don't know. Um, it, the, the one thing I wanted on Michael Alessa's question on um, how we can uh, 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 you know, make the uh, citizens of the countries that made already bad experiences losing money uh, uh, in past episodes um, uh, you know, feel more confident. Uh, obviously, I would argue that financial literacy still plays a role uh, because it helps you to understand that you have higher return if you have a long breath, no, in the equity side. So you will uh, sooner or later earn if you hold. 
uh, in contrary to if you uh, invest and divest uh, in the short term and may be subject to the volatility of the equity markets. Um, uh, I would point you to also to uh, the panel that is coming on the banking union because there will be Monique Goyons uh, from the Consumer Protection Bureau, uh, the European one, uh, which I believe plans to talk about enforcement of consumer protection. And I do think this is an important topic. Uh, but since he is the expert, I would ask you to, uh, for your patience, that this comes up and what she lets us know in which direction she would like to go on the enforcement side. No, Monique? Okay, good. She promises. Okay. Uh, Sean, will would you? Yeah, yeah um, look, I, there's a kind of central theme which I, I detect through the three questions, um, which is you know, how do we get this balance right between encouraging the growth of markets by facilitating access to issuers and investors? while at the same time, you know, maintaining a degree of uh, a standard of market integrity, a standard of protection that allows people to remain confident in those markets. Because it doesn't matter how easy you make it for people to use markets. If they don't believe they're safe or they don't believe they're, they're sound markets, then they will not participate. Or worse again, they may participate, have a bad experience, and then have a sort of cultural shock that has been, been mentioned. So this, I think, is a problem that we face as uh, regulators, legislators, all the time. How do we strike that balance? If I go down to the three questions in terms of the equity market, um, well, as Philip has said, we have a, you know, tried to address this debt bias in the CMU action plan. The problem with the debt equity bias, of course, is that it's in the area of taxation, which is an area of unanimity for member states, an area where member states are quite reluctant to, to go. Um, we have, however, had you know, quite a success around withholding taxes. I mean, we, had, we now have a sort of code of conduct on how to handle the application and indeed the, the reclaiming of withholding taxes, which I wouldn't have thought we would have got, and we certainly didn't get before we put it in the context of the Capital Markets Union. So we have reason to be confident that if we can put this debt equity bias in a more general discussion around the need to boost and create single or more integrated equity markets, we may get something more out of it. But typically, discussing tax with member states is not the most, is not the easiest thing for the Commission uh, to do. In terms of, uh, <laughs> indeed, Oli. <laughs> um, in, you know, I go back to my previous life around Jovenir reports. The equity markets is particularly tricky to integrate because of post-trading problems. Uh, corporate laws tend to be different across different member states. We would need to work to harmonize these uh, to make cross-border equity holding more easy. There's an issue of culture. You know, in some countries, the culture is stronger than others. If you look across Europe, some member states have a much stronger equity culture than others. And it doesn't emerge in the countries where you think it will. Um, so there is a sort of cultural thing as well. So all of this means that if we're going to build the equity market, it has to be sort of strong, but let's not assume that it's going to be fast. We have to work on a number of issues, and we are working on a number of issues, but I'm not going to promise you that you know, in the next year you're going to triple your, your, your equity volumes. On MIFID II, I always have to remind people that we are the only people that do impact assessments on, on our legislation. They are then changed subsequently and are not impact assessed. So what, what has come out now is, a, you know, is the result of the co-legislator. We will eventually have to impact assess this. It's quite soon to do so, however. It's only a few months in, in place. We are monitoring compliance. Um, so far, so good. But of course, we will only see compliance issues emerge over time. I was dragged back from my Christmas holidays because the 3rd of January was a big day. But you know, nothing was ever going to happen on the 3rd of January. I was there anyway, just in case, but nothing happened. Problems with MIFID will emerge over time, and we will have to, to monitor those. We have a commitment to review it anyway, a uh, formal commitment, so in that context, it will have to be done. Um, and in terms of you know, how, we ma how we kind of manage the MAD mar against the need to develop markets, um, well, again, this is this balance we have to find. What I can say is that in the CMU, we've been trying to simplify for SMEs in particular. We've been trying to introduce a degree of proportionality. And if we can get that right, these less developed markets are much more reliant on SMEs than others. So that may help them as well. But again, this is not about just tearing up the rule books because you want to develop a local market. If this market is not sound and is not safe and has a problem 
then we could destroy the culture for another generation, and that's something we don't want to do. And, and basically, that comes to your question about historical examples of disasters in these countries. Yes, they're there. Uh, that is why we're trying to do it within an EU framework. So we're trying to say, look, we are giving you this EU framework, and within that framework, we're going to develop these markets. So the risks about manipulation, the risks, the concerns you have, should be less this time uh, than before. But again, you know, it's about building a culture in, in these countries, a culture which was damaged. I don't doubt it. And in terms of mutual funds, absolutely, cross-border investment is the way to go. Anyway, their domestic savings rates probably aren't high enough to support a vibrant local market. They're going to need foreign inflows. And if these come in in the form of mutual funds, all, all the better for us. And then lastly, one thing we're doing at our technical assistance is focusing on the ecosystem. Because, as we know, financial systems are not so much about banks and about people and about money. They're about laws and about the ecosystem. And if this is not right, then nothing will develop. So the work we're doing with them on the technical level is really about that. What do you need in your specific situation to help your market uh, develop? You probably don't need a CCP, but you may need a network of business angels, that, that kind of discussion. Okay, I think we have time for a second round of questions. So I had Bernard and the gentleman in the back and the gentleman there in the front. So let's. And Oli Rehn, of course. Thank you. I would like to ask a question on the um, final part of the presentation by Jean Berdigan, um, and, and more specifically on his last um, his last slide on ICOs. I think that there's a statement there that uh, ICOs, uh, I think you say, could serve as a as the basis for the development of a new funding vehicle for innovative startups and scale-ups. I'd like you to expand a bit on, a bit on that. So what, what exactly is the economic or financial purpose that you think ICOs can serve and the other institutions that you, I think, rightly mentioned as the correct benchmark, like um, uh, venture capital or crowdfunding cannot adequately serve? We collect again, yep. so um, we had Bernard in the back there. Yes, Bernard Winkler from the ECB. I have three questions. Uh, the first comes back to the um, definition of financial structure. So why do you define it as equity over bank debt only rather than uh, equity to um, all credit, all debt? And that would then better relate to Modigliani Miller uh, capital structure. Um, uh, is the um, irrelevance theorem uh, now irrelevant? Question mark on the theory side. Second question to both of you: uh, Would you like to, uh, European financial structure, uh, however you define it now, uh, like to, uh, that to look uh, more like the U.S. or like Germany? Now, in the U.S. over the last years, we have seen the role of public uh, equity go actually down. There's much more equity down taken, taken private, dark pools and private equity, and we have had massive share buybacks, so actually debt is going up and equity is going down as a, as a, as a ratio. Whereas in Germany, if you look at the Mittelstand, for example, 15 years ago, the Eigenkapital quote of the German Mittelstand was 3 to 5% which is now 27%. So my question to both of you, could there be cases where there's too much equity rather than too little equity? And to comment on the US situation, which is going clearly to a debt equity swap in, the, in a very different direction. Final question on clarification for statistics on Philip's point. When you compare debt to equity, do you actually um, take into account that in Europe, most equity is not public? It's pri uh, it's um, it's um, unquoted shares rather than quoted shares. And there's a massive difference to the US and other places. Second point, do you take out the equity holdings on the asset side of the corporate balance sheet? The cross holdings, uh, where in the US flow funds actually that is netted out and in the Europe it is not netted out. And finally, wouldn't it be a good idea to take out the valuation effect? Because otherwise, 
the greatest moment for financial structure was the equity bubble in 2000, where equity prices clearly were out of, out of kilter. And then, of course, the nominal debt uh, is, is, is not uh, a mark to market. So I think the measure is quite, uh, quite uh, open to discussion, I would say. Otherwise, we want to, uh, you want to support bubbles. And that's a question for both of you in terms of the uh, financial structure. Thank you. OK. I, I had Oli Rehn, and then I had one more. Need to be careful with time, then. Okay. If you could keep your, sorry, I should have said that before the last question. I tried so to have one concise question. One concise. <laughs> um, so, Simuta, Alliance Global Investors. Uh, there, there, there was one point I liked uh, because it's not enough mentioned in my view. It's about reorganizing proceedings and creditor participation for further improving insolvency frameworks. I say this because we see how important this is, notably in Italy versus Spain, for example. I think that's also a big driver of the different trajectories of these banking systems. So my question is, how do you believe uh, Europe can help in this regard? Because it's a very national uh, framework, insolvency frameworks are very national. And sometimes, like in Italy, in my view, it's a question also of uh, financial means because there are not enough judges in some places, for example. It's as simple as this. So wha what, um, yeah, what concretely can Europe do? And I think it's a very, very good topic to, to bring up uh, in the agenda. I think uh, looking at time, because we have also to go to the press briefing or during the break, so let's have quickly um, a round of, do you want to make a start this time? On, or, ah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot. Oh, sorry. One, he one used more. to be my boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, nice sure, sure. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Terrified by the clock. Thanks, uh, Philip. Uh, thanks, uh, Son Olleren, the Bank of Finland. Uh, my question concerns uh, the banking union and its uh, completion, which should be the priority of the EMU reform. I think there is uh, a fairly broad consensus on that, at least in the central banking uh, community. There is uh, uh, the conditions. Uh, the roadmap uh, for that, uh, especially related uh, to the risk reduction, i.e. the reduction of uh, non-performing loans, uh, the legacy problems. Uh, now, I checked uh, last night uh, the latest uh, figures uh, from the SSM uh, concerning uh, Italy, which is uh, what we are talking about, especially when we talk about uh, NPLs. Uh, and uh, in Italy, uh, the share of uh, NPLs uh, has uh, of total total loan stock has gone down from 16% uh, to 11%, uh, around 11% uh, in the past uh, six quarters, past uh, 18 months, and uh, it's gone down uh, from the in terms of uh, absolute amounts uh, from uh, something like uh, 290 to 180, 85 billion euros. Now. A simple question, because we need to make uh, progress on the completion of the banking union. A uh, very simple question. I'm going to Rome uh, in 10 days, uh, so uh, could you advise me what should I say there in this regard? Uh, is, uh, is the glass uh, half uh, empty or half uh, full? And uh, are we meeting the conditions uh, of the roadmap uh, towards uh, the banking union? Okay, we, we do have to hurry a little bit because we have that press briefing. So, um, uh, let me let me let me make it start again. Okay, uh, yeah. John, and uh, then you carry on. So, um, uh, whether the glass is empty or the glass is full is usually depends on the perspective of the drinker, right? So, um, uh, now we have the view. Uh, that the risk reduction has made substantial progress and has reached a stage that it can be matched by uh, appropriate risk sharing uh, steps. Um, and uh, that includes um, the progress to moving to the next stage of EDIS, um, in our view. Um, and uh, actually, the EDIS even proposal even uh, offers an opportunity to build in further incentives for risk reduction in terms of the risk sensitivity of the contributions. 
So uh, one, the one means of, of dealing with these concerns is to build in into the uh, contribution scheme uh, the risk sensitivity elements that relate to the concerns, whether it's NPLs or other, other concerns with risk reduction, which would then you know, allow to, to move forward um, and actually have this parallelism in risk reduction and risk sharing. Um, I will not answer all the questions from Bernhard. Uh, I will do it in private, all the technical questions, but very, um, very simply, um, a, a very quick, um, why bank debt to equity? Because uh, we have seen significant corporate bond market growth, so at this stage I see the issue more on the equity side uh, than on the, on the bond side. That's one answer. The second answer is, uh, indeed, the data don't allow you to go backwards so much to, to actually do the estimations. We have the estimations for the ratio for the measure that we have, equity to bank debt, because the corporate bond data don't allow you to go back and make the same type of analysis. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I don't think I need to go to extremes in terms of what is clear is that we need to develop both the public and the private equity markets along a number of dimensions in Europe. And it is very much depends on which region or country you're talking about. It was very clear from John's presentation. So I don't think I have to choose between do I go the US or do I go Germany. Uh, as regards the very high equity levels of Mittelstand, I think that one factor here is uh, very peculiar, very specific, has to do with inheritance. So I'm not sure uh, that uh, um, that, uh, that 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 this, we should hang too much on this uh, on this uh, equity uh, ratios. As regards the uh, valuation effects, um, if, if you I don't pull up the slide again, but um, uh, that should you can do it with issuance, uh, but then you have shorter time series again. Um, uh, but if you look through my charts, that I, the one chart that I showed but it didn't discuss very much, actually if you draw the trends through the lines, the low equity to, capital, to bank lending ratio relative to the financial development ratio, then um, you see that actually the fluctuations in the equity valuations uh, in, the, in the trend don't play a big role. So I don't think that anything of what we said is, uh, has to do with the particular valuation effects. Um, thank you for the remark on uh, reorganization proceedings and uh, creditor uh, rules, creditor participation rules. So I'm glad for the example that helps us, uh, you raising this, uh, this example. Uh, there are not enough judges. Um, uh, that is uh, in certain, it's not only in this country uh, feature, there's not only the number of judges, there's also the qualifications of the judges, the, the, the legal tradition in terms of the qualifications. Uh, and the cases relative to the number of, of the courts and, and, and so on. And um, so John indicated that it's also not a panacea, but I would still repeat that there, a few countries have actually introduced out of court settlement systems and have made good experiences. Some have made good experiences with that. It seems to be possible to go in this direction. Uh, so, um, I, I think that maybe that can partly relieve uh, the, the issue of a shortage of the judicial stuffing and, and, and their qualifications, depending on how you design these, these two these systems. And I gave two ways of you would go either a non-binding guideline or a, a more formal EU um, uh, out-of-court settlement, uh, settlement regime. Something that I actually did not mention, maybe I should have mentioned, is um, that the OECD has done very interesting work on SME procedures. Actually, uh, one issue is that the procedures insolvency frameworks are too heavy for small uh, companies and too costly, actually. Uh, the judicial systems are particular, the legal um, uh, arrangements are very costly for formal court proceedings, and actually by Introducing, and there's also a number of countries that actually have introduced them successfully in Europe, so actually other countries could follow suite and actually also do SME, special lighter uh, SME-related uh, insolvency procedures, which may have potentially also have a beneficial effect on the concern that you raised in terms of overburdened uh, judicial systems. Let me stop here, so in the interest of time. Yeah, uh, I'll be very quick. Um, on ICOs, I hope I didn't give the impression I want to displace other types of funding. We are trying to create as many types of different types of financing as we can. So in the CMU Action Plan, we also want to boost venture capital. I mean, we were trying this since 2000. Uh, we're still trying it. 
we have legislated on crowdfunding to try to allow it to scale up. And this will be another possibility. So this should be a complement rather than something that kind of competes. And it will create competition and, and diversification in the market. It's a possibility. We have to see how it emerges. But I think my main point was that you know, there has been a lot of focus on the risks associated with these instruments, and there are risks associated with them. But we shouldn't lose completely the sight of that, you know, if properly managed, they can also uh, bring important opportunities. On European financial structure, um, I mean, these comparisons in the United States and Germany, I've been facing these throughout my entire career, and they're nice stylistic comparisons. They allow you to sort of give stylistic interpretations. But you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's not about whether we you know, adopt a German model or we adopt a US model. I suspect if we adopt any model like the US and try to superimpose it on Europe, it won't work. If we adopt a German model and try to superimpose it on Europe, it won't work. We're going to end up with something that suits Europe, because Europe is a collection of many member states. And so it's not about having too much equity, too little equity. It's about diversifying the system. And what I will say is that certainly before the crisis, we have found that we were too reliant on banks. What we have to do in terms of the represent, I mean, I always get this question, am I trying to push banks out of the system? No, I mean, I hope the system grows and that we just get a more diversified uh, structure. But I don't have any particular idea that if we get to 20%, we can stop for equity, or if we get to 30% you know, for debt, we can stop. This is not the way I think we need to think about this. On insolvency frameworks, they are very national, and we have tried in small measure to uh, change them. So in terms of the banking system, we have changed the creditor hierarchy with the BRD. We've introduced new debt instruments, which are you know, senior non-preferred instruments. We have more recently put on the table a very modest proposal, which is an out-of-court settlement uh, type of proposal, which would allow more rapid uh, um, access to collateral for creditors on a voluntary basis, so on a contractual basis. I would sign a contract saying that if I default, you would have accelerated access to my collateral. And for that, you might get a better interest rate. But it's voluntary, it's win-win. The member states are, I would say, lukewarm in their response to this, mainly because the people we talk to are not financial stability experts, but they tend to be ministers of justice. And so when you get into these discussions, uh, you face different people. You know, so we all understand the financial stability aspects of this, but there is another side, which is the sort of social justice side. And so you have a very interesting debate. And as I've commented many times in the past, even when you go in a crisis situation where you imagine there should be no debate about the financial stability needs, of course, the social justice pressures also rise because the risk of dispossession rises as well. So you just end up having the same debate at a much higher level of decibels. Um, and lastly, on banking union, I think the issue is not where it's half full or half empty. It is that it's emptying. <laughs> okay. And why do I say that? Because, I mean, let me be clear what our position is going to be on banking union as we go into June. We think banking union needs to be finished. Okay. We don't think banking union in its current state is resilient enough to survive another significant shock. So we don't have all the time in the world to finish banking union. Am I saying we have to finish it tomorrow? No. But am I saying you can take 25 years to do it? No as well. So what I think we're going to have to do is not get tied up in sort of trigger levels to say, if you get to X, then it's OK. What we're going to have to do, because if we wait for X, we may have to wait 25 years. So what we're going to have to do is be a bit more subtle and say that we look at direction. And if the you know, the, the direction we're traveling is sufficiently good and sufficiently fast, then we move. But I don't think we have the luxury of waiting until you know, we have certain trigger levels of NPLs or certain trigger levels of MREL, et cetera. I think we're going to have to be a little bit more subtle than that and say, if we think the, the, the kind of direction of travel is sufficiently fast and in the right direction, then we can move. And as Philip has said, we think already we've made sufficient progress to move on some parts of the risk-sharing agenda, while accepting that for other parts, we still have a, a bit of work to do. That's it for me. OK, thank you. I, we urgently need a coffee break now uh, uh, for different reasons. Um, so I hope to see you all at 11.15 um, right here for the panels. And uh, uh, stay tuned.
Many of your questions will be answered then by the panels because we have many experts that will actually dwell on these things. Thank you.